Welcome to worship with Hickory Grove United Methodist Church. Uh, I pray that God has blessed you and that uh, this worship service will draw you closer and closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I want to remind you that the word worship uh, in Greek means to bow, to bow before. The idea is that we yield our lives to a great and holy God who is more powerful and greater than us. Today, I want to assure you and you and you and you, each one of you, that our God loves you. Worship him with all your heart and soul. Uh, with that in mind, I would ask that you join me in prayer. Creator God, you made us, you know us, you understand us, and you love us. Thank you, God, for the way that you love us. Thank you for Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross just for each one of us. Let us worship you with all our hearts and souls. Let us worship you with all that we are. And let us follow your command to go and love our neighbors, to love them in somewhat the same way that you love us. I pray that you bless each one who participates in this worship. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is uh, God is an Awesome God. Uh, it's led by Jerry Jordan. And I would encourage you, wherever you are, to sing along. Uh, I will point out there's a good bit of repetition in this song, so it should come natural after you uh, go through a couple of verses. Sing with us. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with we. Our and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with we. Still power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with we. The power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God, God is an awesome, awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with me. So power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Good morning and welcome to church, Hickory Grove United Methodist Church. It's a wet day outside. I wanted to say sunny, but it's a wet day outside. But if you want something to warm your heart, just tune in a few minutes early and listen to Carol's Prelude. What beautiful piano music. She does such a wonderful job every week. So some announcements we have for this morning. Thank you to our Healthy Church Committee for plans that help keep our congregation safe. Due to the high rate of virus in Guilford County, we're worshiping online only this time. The Healthy Church Committee will keep you notified of the church schedule. Also, pray for all who work together to plan these services. 
United Methodist men have decided to cancel the February Brunswick's due due to the high rate of COVID-19 in our county. Our wonderful Hickory Grove congregation has a reputation as a praying church. Let us continue to pray deeply, earnestly, and frequently. If you have not been contacted by one of our communication group leaders about prayer concerns, please let Linda Weistel or Pastor Leon know, and they'll find a group for you. Hickory Grove United Methodist Church is having a live streaming devotion at 8 p.m. each evening. We encourage you to participate. You can also see a recorded version of it on our Facebook page. Thank you for participating in worship. Please consider reading the scripture before Sunday worship. The scripture for next week will be Mark chapter 1 verses 29 through 39. Also pray for the musicians as they make plans for this service. As you prepare your hearts, consider asking a friend to worship with us through the online streaming service. Thank you for your financial support of our church, and we continue to need that support. You can give online at www.hickorygroveumc.org. Just press on the Give Online button, or you can mail a check to Hickory Grove UMC 5959 Hickory Grove Road, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27409. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Psalter today is from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Full of honor and majesty are the works of the Lord, whose righteousness endures forever. Who has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord provides food for the faithful and is ever mindful of his covenant. The Lord has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of the Lord's hands are faithful and just. The precepts of the Lord are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. The Lord set redemption to his people and has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and wondrous is God's name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a great understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever. And now Pastor Leon's going to bring us a children's time. It is great to have a chance to talk with our kids, uh, and I really appreciate our children. If you have a uh, computer on and maybe the children have wandered into another room to play with a toy or something, I would encourage you to bring them back and, and let's, uh, get our children to look at the computer screen and talk to me for just a couple of minutes. Uh, I have something I want to tell you about. And kids, today uh, I want to ask you a question. I have something with me. And I'll bet you know what this is. This is something that we, almost every house that I know has a remote control. Do you have a remote control in your house? Uh, who uses the remote control most often? Sometimes in almost every family, one person uses it more than the other one. 
there are a lot of buttons on the remote control. There's one that takes the volume up and down. There's one that can change channels. There's one that can mute the sound. And there are other buttons that will do different things on here. But one button that I think is most important is the on and off button, the power button. It controls everything. If you turn the power button off, then you can't use the others. You can't change the volume if everything is turned off. The power button is important. It has a lot of control. Today, I'm going to read some scripture in a few minutes. Uh, and I want you to, to stay around uh, after some singing and all of that as I, as I uh, read this scripture. The scripture will be about Jesus. And Jesus has a lot of authority, a lot of power. A little bit like the power button on our remote control. Jesus has the power to do things, to make things happen. When I read the scripture, you will hear about a man who had a very terrible problem. Uh, he had something evil inside of him. And Jesus Christ is so strong, his power is so great, that he told that evil to be quiet and to come out of the man, and the man got well. What a wonderful thing to hear about. Jesus used his power, his authority, to make a man get well. If you listen to the scripture in a few minutes, pay attention to that idea. Now I want you to pray with me. Remember how we pray. First, we put our hands together like this, and then we, when, after we close our eyes, I will tell you to say something, and you say it back. Put your hands together, close your eyes, and pray with me. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Be with my family. Be with my family. Use your power, use your power to protect the people I love to protect the people I love. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us in this time. Um, and now we adults will turn our attention to uh, a time of prayer, and we enjoy and in, invite the children who are still with us to, to pray with us also. Uh, we have uh, many concerns, uh, and as Bill mentioned in the announcements earlier, this is a praying church. And because our church prays so much, People all around send requests to us, and today I have several requests I would like for us to lift up. So join me in this time of prayer. Great and holy God, we come before you, yielding our hearts and minds to you. You are great, you are powerful, you are the creator of all things. We pray to you. Today, God, we lift up uh, uh, Martha and Jean Merriman. They're going through a very difficult time as Jean continues to have problems with his throat. Uh, he has difficulty swallowing, and sometimes he has difficulty breathing. Be with him as they go to have uh, special surgery later this month. Uh, God, I lift up uh, several people who uh, we know in, in ministry who are dealing with the COVID virus. Thank you that uh, uh, our former district superintendent, Nancy Rankin, and her husband are improving. He is now home from the hospital. We lift up our current uh, district superintendent, Bev Copley and her husband as they are, uh, get, as they are dealing with COVID at home. Uh, I pray, I thank you, God, that, uh, minister, that a minister in our group, uh, Reverend Brenda Newman, is better and is now beginning to work again uh, after, as she recovers from COVID. And we pray for uh, Reverend Tammy Ingram and, and her family uh, as her father-in-law died recently from COVID. Uh, God, I lift up... Uh, Sharon Land, uh, one of our church members, uh, she is sad and dealing with the fact that her mother, uh, Jewel, uh, has fallen and broken a few bones and is now receiving care uh, outside the home. Sharon has taken care of her mother, Jewel, who is 98 years old, for a long time, and it is a difficult change to have someone else take care of Jewel. Be with that family at this time. Um, God, I lift up uh, Neil Weitzel as he has a re reoccurrence of cancer. Uh, I pray for a friend of our church, Sally Askew, uh, as she deals with the grief from, her, from the sudden death of her son, Dennis. God, uh, one of our church members uh, is, is having a very sad and difficult time. Uh, we remember the sudden death of Billy Ball, and we lift up Jay and all of the rest of the family uh, at this time, and ask that you hold them and give them peace. Uh, many of this family lives uh, in other states and not very close to our church, so we can't 
see them as much as we would like, but I pray for all of the Ball family. I lift up Beth Carroll, uh, who has uh, orthopedic problems. Uh, she has an infection in her ankle, in the bone in her ankle, and pain from her back that is causing difficulty with movement. Be with Beth. Uh, Holy God, I lift up uh, Sharon and Carl Weekly as they continue to deal with the pain that, ha that Sharon has related to uh, her cancer. Uh, I pray for uh, Lorraine Cruz, uh, who is now in hospice care. Lorraine is the cousin of Martha Garrett. I pray for the family of Nat, Nat Sewers, uh, who passed away this week. Uh, he's the brother-in-law of Bill and Crystal Courier. Uh, we pray for all of that family, that you give them your comfort and peace. I lift up Gary and Sharon Pearson uh, in this difficult time in their life and ask that you hold them and take care of them. God, we also praise you for the blessings you have brought into our lives. We thank you that uh, Don is better and is back at home now, and we ask that you continue to be with him and Dot. Thank you for them and for all that they contribute to our church. Thank you that Gene Shanks has been able to, to move and get to his new address and uh, to live in this new apartment. We praise you for having friends who helped him move. Holy God, we praise you especially for the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus came, um, ultimately he brought salvation for all of us, but while he was here on this earth, he taught us how to love other people, to care for those who, ha who are in need, to reach out to the sick. He also taught us how to pray. So God, we join together as one family, praying the prayer that Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, one thing I like about our church is that we encourage different people to be involved in parts of the service. Uh, our choir and choir members in particular add to all of our worship. Today, uh, one of our choir members, uh, Jim King, uh, is going to bring the anthem. Listen and watch as Jim brings, uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. the hand 
hand of Jesus Felt the healing of his fingertips It burned like fire This burning desire And I spoke the tongue of angels Felt the hand of the devil in the night And it burned like fire But it was cold as stone But I still Join me in prayer. Holy God, help me to preach your word and that only. Holy Spirit, touch the hearts of all who worship with us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. Um, as I prepare to read the scripture this morning, I want to tell you just a little bit of background to sort of get us focused. Uh, the Greek word Eutheos means immediately, and that specific word is used frequently by Mark in his gospel. Uh, it's almost a characteristic that's common in his, his uh, story of the life of Jesus. In his short gospel, the shortest of the four gospels, he uses the word 17 times. Eleven of those times he uses in this very first chapter. Uh, it's only used uh, 17 times more in other, other places in the, in the, uh, go the other Gospels only use the word uh, euthaios immediately uh, 17 times as a total. So Mark uses it uh, frequently, he uses it often, and it's only used one time outside of the Gospels in the Greek, and that's in the book of, of Acts. Uh, the point here is there is a sense of urgency. Now, that sense of urgency isn't always obvious when we read it in the modern English translations. I like the modern English translations, but this is one little bit of a weakness. Uh, they will use other words like quickly or suddenly or something like that. And we may not realize that Mark is saying immediately, 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 over and over again. Uh, it, it helps us to focus on the immediate presence of God. Uh, in fact, I titled this sermon in sort of an odd way, the authority of Jesus right now, just to sort of help us focus on this idea of the immediacy of Jesus' authority, uh, his authority in the presence right now in our lives. With that idea in mind, just sort of think about that as you hear, uh, as I'll read 
Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 28 and going through, I'm sorry, beginning at 21 and going through 28. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. Then the news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Uh, one of my favorite uh, modern theologians, a guy named Tom Wright, uh, looked at these verses, and as he explained these verses, he began with a story about uh, a great disaster at sea. There was a tourist boat uh, that was filled with tourists going on vacation to different places, and, and there were, they had parked their cars in the hold of the ship, and, the, and they were going across the water when water started rushing in. One of the doors had not closed properly. Uh, people began to scream, and there was all sorts of confusion as the ship was obviously sinking. One man, who just was another tourist, another person on the boat like anyone else, stood up, and with a, he had a loud voice, and as he stood up, he started shouting commands, move over here, you group go over there, open that door, gave those kinds of instructions. There was a kind of relief uh, with the anxiety at that point because at least somebody was taking control, telling the people what to do. As a result of his orders and commands and the fact that people got organized a little bit, many, many lives were saved. As th that group started moving out of the, the part of the boat they were in, the man knew there were some people down in another level, and he went down and organized a group of people to hold on to the wall with one hand and to lift people up with the other, sort of a ch human chain to move people up. Many of that group were also saved. After the ship had sunk and they got all of the stuff together, all the information together, and, and looked at the records, they realized that the man had died himself. He assumed authority. He had no authority from the ship, from the people who owned the, owned the cruise line, but he was the authority on scene. He, he took authority by his action. Now, the thing I want to talk about here is authority. Where does authority come from? A queen has inherited authority. Uh, a, a president of a corporation has delegated authority. The <clears throat> board of directors tell him how much, him, uh, uh, the lady or the man of the, the president, how much authority they have. A professor has achieved authority. It's achieved because this professor has taught classes and written books and done research and knows what he or she is talking about. The man in this uh, uh, story that I told had assumed authority. It was assumed because of his action and his voice. All of those authorities, all of those sources of authority are completely unlike the authority of God, the authority of Jesus Christ. The authority of God comes uh, as a real authority. When people uh, at his, who were there at the time that Jesus was alive saw him and heard him, they recognized he had real authority. It is divine authority. It is authority that is intrinsic. Uh, it is part of who God is to have this authority. It does not come from any other source or any other action or any behavior on human part. It is part of who God is. It is intrinsic authority. Another thing that's special about the authority of Jesus Christ is that it is infallible. A queen 
even though she is inherit, has inherited authority, could make a mistake and issue the wrong kind of, of uh, edict to her subjects. A professor may know a lot, and we should listen to our professors, but we need to realize that they have human achieved authority, and it could be in error in some cases. Jesus Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ, is intrinsic and infallible. Hold on to the fact, this is important, hold on to the fact that Jesus Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ, is intrinsic and infallible. Now, hold that idea. I want to talk about something different for just a moment. I want to talk about immediacy. And I want to talk about immediacy with a, a story that many of you will, are familiar with, or an, an issue that many of you are familiar with, or people especially my age are familiar with this. When I was a kid in school, I was taught that Pluto was the ninth planet. I had to learn that for science classes. Now, as an older guy, I have learned through uh, newspapers and other things that I read that Pluto is not a planet. So what's going on here? What happened was that at 1930, the newest and best scientific equipment, telescopes and stuff, discovered this new small planet that was very far away, and they named it Pluto. And everybody was excited about it, so we all learned about this new planet, Pluto. But over the years, with more and better equipment, scientists uh, discovered other objects out there that were farther away, but they were about the same size as Pluto, and they didn't want to call them planets because they really weren't like the rest of our planets, Earth and Mars and all, Venus and all of that. They were really different. So here they were stuck. They had named one of these objects Pluto and called it a planet. But if they call that a planet, what about all of the others? Well, they couldn't make up their minds. So in the 2000s, um, uh, in the late 1900s, they were stuck and they worked on this. And um, I have written down the date and I've lost it now here. I think it was August of 2006. But one year early in the 2000s, they finally got all together and they decided the, of the correct definition of a planet and Pluto didn't fit. And that's why we no longer call um, Pluto a planet. I trust the scientific community. I like the scientific method. I think it has helped our world progress. And the way the scientific method works is we come up with ideas and we think this is the right answer. This explains things like what is a planet. And then we do more research and we said, well, no, we can refine that. We can make it slightly better. We can improve the scientific method is always improving us by changing the way, that, the way we understand the world around us. For example, uh, around the time of World War II and maybe just before that, many of the best doctors and the best scientists were convinced that tobacco smoke helped clear people's lungs. It made people cough and clear out uh, stuff out of their lungs. So it was good for us to, to take in tobacco smoke. More research, we've learned that no, that's not actually true. The tobacco actually causes people to have problems in their lungs that causes the coughing. So, so we change and we move. The, the point I'm making is that, that we change over the years. We learn something that is different. Now let's go back to Pluto for just a moment. I am convinced that the scientists know what they're talking about. Whether they call it Pluto a planet or whether they don't call it Pluto, whether they don't call Pluto a planet, that's fine with me. Because you know what? I really don't care. You know, I mean, I care in a way because I'm concerned. I look at the night sky now and then. But in my day-to-day -day life, it just does not matter to me whether or not Pluto is a planet or whether it is an object in the sky that's not a planet. I don't even think about it for weeks and months at a time. I can go years and not even think about it. It does not matter in my day-to-day -day life. Unfortunately, unfortunately, many people have the same attitude about God about the things in the Bible. They say, oh yes, I believe in God. Oh yes, I believe in those words in the Bible even though they've, though they've never Bible. They say, I, I like that, I'm in favor of it. And they put it on the shelf. They put God somewhere out of their mind and they go about their daily life as if God doesn't exist. As if the authority of Jesus Christ doesn't matter. Day after day, they uh, go on. Now, I think the problem is that things that are distant from us don't influence us. At least things that we, don't, that we think of as being distant from us don't, don't influence us very much. 
Um, I know some people will understand this example. Christmas, Thanksgiving, somewhere along there, you eat too much pumpkin pie. You gain five or ten pounds. And you start on a diet in January and say, I'm going to knock off those five pounds. I'm going to knock off those ten pounds. I want to, to lose this weight that I've gained. So you make pretty good progress until one day somebody puts your favorite slice of pie, puts that pumpkin pie right in front of you with a fork. And there it is. Pumpkin pie, fork. It looks good. It smells good. The scales that you're going to weigh on are in another room. It's another week before it's your day to, to weigh yourself anyway. So why not? I'll eat it right now. The thing that is immediate, that is right in front of us, makes a difference. An example I have used even from this pulpit that some of you know, but I want to repeat it, uh, is the power of, about the power of the immediate, is if I ask you, almost anyone, would you get up and walk across the room and touch the door on the other side? If you will, if you'll do that, I'll give you $100. Most people say, sure, I'll walk across the room to touch a wall or touch a door for $100. And I'll say, good, I want you to do that. But I need to remind, to tell you something, I'm not going to give you that $100 for 100 years. I will give it to you, but I'm going to wait 100 years and put it in an envelope with your name on it, and you can have it in 100 years. Most people say, Oh, no, not me. They settle back in their chair and say, I'm not going to walk across the room to get that $100 for 100, if, if I don't get it for 100 years. Now, if you think about that, they, get this, they have to put in the same amount of effort and they get the same amount of reward, the same amount of pay, the same $100. The difference is the amount of time between the two. When we have pets, if you're trying to train your pet to do something uh, or some animal to do something, if you have it a reward, but wait a week to give it that reward, it doesn't matter. It does not change the dog or the monkey's behavior. You have to give it to it right then. It, the, how close it is matters. We need to have a close relationship with Jesus Christ. We, have a, we need to have immediate daily contact with our scriptures, with prayer. It is through this staying immediate, staying close to God, through this closeness that we have through prayer, daily prayer, through daily scripture reading, through being engaged in our Christian faith, that we have that immediate contact with the authority of Jesus Christ. Okay, so hold those, those two ideas, go together. The authority, the power of God, and the immediacy. We ignore it, we don't, we're not aware of it, if it is distant, if we're not engaged with God. This man that is the center of the scripture today uh, in verses 23 and 24, this man had a problem with evil spirits. This man in the synagogue was possessed by a spirit and it cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Why are you here? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The spirit understood. The spirit realized that it was in, in the presence of Jesus Christ. Let's think about these um, uh, spirits and this idea for just a moment. Most of us have seen cartoon strips, uh, maybe a dog that's standing somewhere in a cartoon strip, and as the dog is standing there happily, a little kitten comes along. The dog doesn't really like the kitten, but he knows the owner likes the kitten, and the, the kitten falls into a well, and it's in danger. The dog is able to reach somehow in the cartoon and get the kitten out, and it starts to do that, but a little devil shows up on its shoulder that says, you don't really like the kitten, let it stay in there and drown. But the little angel pops up on the other shoulder and says, wait a minute, you know that the people in the house really like the kitten, they want you to save it, save it if you can. Now, some of us tend to think of the conflict between God and Satan as a cartoon, as something that is sort of silly. And I want to emphasize today, I want to tell you that, that the conflict between good and evil, between Satan and God, is real and it matters. The devil is walking around like a roaring lion, looking for souls to devour. We learned that in 1 Peter chapter 5. The devil is walking around like a roaring lion, looking for souls to devour. 
There is a cosmic warfare between God and Satan, and Satan is seeking to destroy human beings and the earthly creation of God. Take a moment and think about the evil in this world. You probably know each one of us has our own little point of view about the world. What evil do you know about? Have you heard about uh, people who abuse children? Uh, have you heard about the sex traffickers that, that take young ladies and, well, we won't even talk about what they do. What about the opioid epidemic? You know, with the COVID virus being in the news all the time, some of us have almost forgotten about the opioid epidemic. People are dying from this addiction. It's a terrible addiction. And it's not always just some young guy on the street corner that's addicted to opioids. There are many of our senior citizens who are hurting somewhere and they get a little bit of pain medicine and before you know it, they are addicted. There is a problem with addictions. Illness, death, lies, conflict, problems between people and groups of people. There is danger, there's evil in this world. We tend to think of the problem with satanic evil as being a little bit like the way I described the planet Pluto. It's something far away that doesn't affect our daily lives. But evil is real and evil is dangerous. Uh, we learn about the seven deadly sins uh, in church. Now, I'm not going to spend very much time on that this morning, just to mention that, that they are not chapter and verse in the Bible, but they are, the seven deadly sins are a, a good way of understanding the problems that we face as humans. And I would encourage you to, to look, look these up and learn a little more about lust and gluttony. I think greed is one of the real bad ones. I think that greed is behind, oh, I don't know, I, I remember reading a while back about this medication that was extremely important for children. And the pharmaceutical companies had jacked the prices up really high. Greed is behind those kinds of things. Sloth. Are any of us get a little too lazy to read our Bible one day? Wrath. Envy. I think that pride is one that we need to take just a moment and think about. Pride is behind many of the others. Uh, uh, many Bible scholars and religious leaders over the years in the Christian faith have said that, that pride is the most serious of deadly sins, uh, that it is the father of all of the other sins. Two things I want to say about evil. One, it is real and it is more dangerous than most people realize. And second, I want to say that Jesus defeats evil and he calls us to join him in overpowering it in the world. In this scripture today, Jesus spoke to the Spirit and caused it to come out of, this, out of this man. Jesus cared for the man who was suffering. In verses 25 and 26 we read, But Jesus reprimanded him, Be quiet, come out of the man, he ordered. And the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and came out of him. What evil demons possess our loved ones? Think about the people that we know, the people we care about. What hurts them? I am telling you that Jesus has authority, real authority, real power over evil, and he can help us right now. I'm telling you that evil does exist uh, and that our loved ones are in dangerous right now. Most of all, I want you to hear that just as Jesus took care of the man who was suffering, he will take care of us and our families. Mark uses the word for immediately over and over and over. And I titled this sermon, The Authority of Jesus, right now to emphasize both the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus, and the importance of being close to him right now. Stay close to Jesus. We stay close to Jesus by reading the Bible regularly. We stay close to Jesus by uh, participating in worship, however we can do that. We stay close to Jesus by having prayer every day. We also stay close to Jesus by doing good deeds. Uh, our church uh, just a couple of weeks ago had a, a food drive, and we collected food in a safe way and just took it to people who needed that food. When we help other people, we are staying close to Jesus. 
In James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, we read, So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Will you follow him if he calls your name? Will you go with him and never be the same? Will you change your life? to be near to Jesus, to have an immediate, close relationship. It is important because the authority of God will bring power over Satan, and Satan is real. Will you follow him if he calls your name? Will you go with him and never be the same? Join in singing the summons led by Godwin Primsing as our closing hymn. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but Should your life a crack or scare? Will you let my answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen? And not me to what I'm in you and you in me. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around? Through my sight and touch and sound in you and you. Lord, your summon sake was true, and you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you, and never be the same. In your company I'll go, where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you, and you in me. Father, Help us to live our lives to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen.